So I was very pleased to be able to, to go to this and um, uh, meet with all sorts of folks at the, at the conference. All right, the book that changed the world 500 years ago. This is a three-part message. We talked about uh, Rasmus and who he was in five great world events last week. Do you recall what those were? Uh, there's not going to be a quiz, so don't worry about that. But you remember the first one was May 29th, 1453, the fall of Constantinople, when the Ottoman Empire uh, conquered the city after a seven-week siege, and these monks and scribes had fled from there before the conquest of the city and went into Europe and brought with them manuscripts that had been copied for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the Renaissance got a shot in the arm, and the Reformation got its material basis taken care of at that point when all these Greek manuscripts got into the rest of Europe. Five years later, the first university in, in Europe to offer a course on ancient Greek offered a course on ancient Greek, the University of Paris, 1458. And the next year after the fall of Constantinople, 1454, we had the invention of the um, movable type printing press, Johannes uh, Gutenberg in Mainz, Germany. And he published his uh, Gutenberg Bible, which was the Latin Vulgate. Uh, the printing press changed the accessibility of books for lay folks. For, by lay folks, I mean those who did not have deep pockets, who were not wealthy people. And up until that time, only the wealthy could own a book because they'd have to pay a scribe to copy the whole thing out and uh, kill a bunch of sheep or goats or sometimes even uh, cattle uh, to uh, make these books, the parchment for these books. Uh, it, it would be an enormous undertaking and quite expensive and the uh, Latin Vulgate, all those copies were done on parchment, on animal skins as well. But then later they decided, you know, we can make these books a lot cheaper on paper. So it was a huge thing that now made literature, including and especially the Bible, accessible to the masses. But it simultaneously also caused us as the human family to devalue memorization. It wasn't as necessary. And the other great event that has caused that has been what we're living through right now, the internet and personal computers, where you, and, and cell phones. I mean, good grief, you don't need to memorize portions of scripture because the only Bible that uh, you had around was at the church. I mean, what would happen if Believer's Chapel had one Bible, and it was here, locked up to the pulpit, a chain Bible is what they used to call these, and uh, only Dan Duncan had access to it. The rest of you, when you're hearing it Sunday morning, you're trying to soak it in as best you can to memorize what you heard. Your skills at memorization would be so much better than they are now, and my skills as well. So with the printing press, there was a blessing and a curse that came. Same thing with the internet and personal computers. The third event was Columbus, October 12th, 1492, coming to America, although he never knew he discovered it. And that increased the whole... Uh, business of adventure, uh, daring, moving beyond our borders, getting outside of the box, and uh, European imperialism, if you will. And it expanded our knowledge, even though we didn't know what it expanded to at the time. But that got all sorts of countries to come over to uh, the, the New World. And then the fifth event was uh, October 31st, 1517, when Luther at least published somehow his 95 theses, whether he nailed them to the door of the Schlosskirche in Wittenberg or not, we don't know. But he did make known that he had 95 criticisms uh, of the Roman Catholic uh, Church and wanted to have a debate uh, there in Wittenberg about those issues. Uh, within three weeks, those 95 theses were printed on several printing presses throughout Europe and 100,000 copies were made and the Reformation was born before, before, because of it. Now, if you're taking notes or listening attentively, you'll know, well, you skipped number four. Well, the fourth event, which happened almost to the day, 20 months prior to uh, the beginning of the Reformation, was the publication of the first Greek New Testament. That is the first one to be published, and it was Erasmus's uh, whole new instrument, Novum Instrumentum Omne, which came out on March 1st, 1516. And that is, again, the material basis for which the, uh, the Reformation owes a great debt. Obviously, the uh, uh, ultimate basis is going to be the providence of God in leading people 
to get these things accomplished. But this is where I wanted to bring us to now is that great publication. And there's two parts to this. I, I was delighted that uh, Dan uh, asked me to speak this year. And he said, uh, what would you like to, to talk about? And I said, I want to talk about Erasmus because this is the 500th anniversary of Erasmus's publication. I had the opportunity to lecture on Erasmus and his New Testament at Purdue University in February and also at uh, Houston Baptist University the last day of February. And this publication came out on March 1st, 1516. So it was almost to the day, 500 years after that happened. It was, that was pretty cool. I don't know what I'll be doing on uh, Reformation Day, except I'll, I, I know I will be in Wittenberg. So. Um, so his Greek New Testament, this is part one, there's two parts to it. And the impact this has on our Bibles today is huge. So let me just get to this first part today. And we've, we, this is just some review to begin with. 20 months prior to the start of the Reformation, a Dutch humanist, that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing at that time, a, a humanist in that era meant somebody who was a literateur. He was somebody who, who, who knew the arts, he knew literature, he knew more than one language and uh, was a good student of, uh, of humanities. It didn't mean somebody who was agnostic or atheist. He was, in fact, a, a Catholic priest his whole life. And he laid the egg that Luther would later hatch. That's what was said even in Erasmus's lifetime. Here's a painting of, of the man. And he was the best Latin scholar in Europe in the 16th century. He began to learn Greek at age 32 and he became the best ancient Greek scholar in the 16th century in Western Europe as well. So I get students at the seminary all the time who say, is it too late for me to start learning Greek? I'm, I'm 27 years old. No, I don't think it's too late. Uh, and they might say, I'm 50 years old and I want to work on a doctor. I just had a student this last year, one of my interns, he wanted to work on his PhD in uh, patristic literature at Edinburgh University. And uh, he had uh, fought in uh, the Second Gulf War. He was a, a pilot uh, for bombers. And what, he, he made this great line. He said, you know, all I'm really good at is killing people. And so, <laughs> so he said, I don't know if I should go on for a PhD or not. I said, well, you know, maybe you can develop another skill too. So, <laughs> so he's now working on his PhD at Edinburgh. And he's going to be uh, Edinburgh, sorry. Uh, he'll be in his mid-50s by the time he uh, completes that degree. But... People are living so much longer nowadays. When Erasmus and Luther around, the average lifespan of a European man was in his mid-40s. Uh, so uh, to start learning Greek at age 32, that would have seemed uh, preposterous. And yet Erasmus decided to do that because he had a thirst for knowledge and wanted to get into the text. Melanchthon wanted him to be a part of the Reformation. Luther uh, argued against Melanchthon, and I might bring some of this out next time. I, I don't recall if, if I, uh, or I, I may not remember to put that into the notes, but uh, it's fascinating to think about the relationship between Luther and uh, Erasmus. Erasmus wrote a book against Luther. I guess I'll tell you about it right now real quickly. At first, Erasmus was a follower of Luther. He was very interested in what Luther was saying, and he liked the whole idea of reformation. He didn't care for uh, the old stodgy uh, political religious system of the Roman Catholic Church, but wanted to get away from that and wanted people to get back to the original languages of the Bible. He wanted uh, priests and scholars to study Greek and Hebrew. And so he began his own quest to do that. Uh, he started with Greek. He began to work on Hebrew. And after a while, he decided, you know, it's just too hard for me to get two foreign languages down. Even though he learned English and he already knew Dutch and was brilliant at uh, Latin and uh, Italian, he learned Italian and German. So, but he just didn't want to learn Hebrew. It was just uh, not an Indo European language, too hard to get that one to. So uh, I, I take great solace in the fact that here Erasmus was the most brilliant Greek and Latin scholar of the 16th century. And he actually said, there's only so much you can stuff into your brain. And so I, I'm uh, encouraged that I don't know my languages as well as I should. Well, I'm not really encouraged. It's, this is not the church to mention that in, is it? So, um, so Erasmus uh, liked what Luther was saying. He liked the idea of getting back to the original languages, back to the sources. This was a line that Erasmus came up with, ad fontes, Latin for to the sources. Uh, 
And uh, the idea was let's get back behind the Latin Vulgate, the official translation of the Bible that was used for centuries, for over a millennium in fact, that was done by Jerome in the late 4th, early 5th century. And that's what the Catholic Church said, this is the inspired Bible. Well, Erasmus had the audacity to publish his own Latin translation and to criticize Jerome's. You can see that that's not the normal Roman Catholic view. And he got in a heap of trouble for doing it. But he published it as a diglot, Greek on one side, Latin on the other. And that's where we pick up our story. So here's a painting of him. He was the prince of the humanists. And I think I told you, I uh, just introduced you last time about his most controversial publication. That's, that's what we'll discuss tonight. It was called the Novum Instrumentum Omne, or for those of you who uh, know Latin better than most biblical scholars, Novum Instrumentum Omne. You don't pronounce the V, but all biblical scholars do because we don't know Latin like we're supposed to. This is the cover page of it, and it wasn't just a whole new instrument, but what you see in this, in this hourglass is the whole title of the book. This is how books used to be done. They didn't know what to call these things, so they'd have, I mean, you, you have the, the, the first line with the large letters is novum in. It's not even one word. It's a breakup of the second word, and that's how they used to do this. But this is a, a, a great copy of it, uh, of his first edition that came out on March 1st, 1516, over a thousand pages. This was the first Greek New Testament published on a printing press. Now, you recall, the original New Testament is written in Greek. To have this now done on a printing press makes it accessible to the masses. And until Constantinople fell in 1453, Greek was hardly known in Western Europe. And so now with the fall of Constantinople and the printing press happening within a year of each other, you have this explosion of knowledge and getting back to the sources that these monks and scribes had brought with them from Constantinople. And consequently, that's what in large part brought us out of the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, a, a recollection of the knowledge that had been lost for so many centuries in uh, medieval uh, Europe. So this was the first published Greek New Testament on, done on a printing press. It's the leg, uh, not the leg, the uh, egg that Erasmus laid that Luther would later hatch. He published five editions. This won't show up on the test, so you don't need to get the dates down. Uh, but uh, no edition was Greek alone. I learned this for the first time about 30 years ago when I went to the Dallas Public Library and they had uh, on display a number of Erasmus's publications that they had gotten from Holland. And I thought, oh, I'd like to see his, his uh, Greek New Testament. They said they had New Testaments there. Now this is before the internet, so I had to call up the library. I actually used this thing called a landline, a telephone, you know, and call them up and find out uh, uh, what they had in their collection. And I got to take some pictures while they're in the display case. But what I was dumbfounded at was all of these New Testaments, they had four or five of them, were just Latin, no Greek. I didn't know at the time that he published his Latin New Testament several times. And when he published his Greek, he never published it as a standalone volume. The reason is because people knew Latin. Scholars knew Latin better than they knew Greek. And so he would publish a diglot where it was Latin and Greek. Five times he did that, five different editions, so that they could consult the Latin to see what the Greek uh, really meant. And he gave his own Latin translation each time. His first edition, as he said, was called A Whole New Instrument. And he did this in Basel, Switzerland, where he ended up spending the rest of his life. He kept going back and forth between Basel and some other places, but he spent the last years of his life, eight years, in Basel. And Froben was the uh, famous publisher who did this, who coaxed him away from a place in Italy to get it done. I just wonder what the history of the Reformation would have been like if he had gotten this published in Italy. I wonder if Italy would be as Roman Catholic as it is today, if uh, it had been different. But the Lord saw fit to have him do this in, in uh, Switzerland. His basis, Erasmus's basis, was eight Greek manuscripts, all of them quite late, second millennium manuscripts. The oldest was from the 11th century, and that was his best manuscript, and the one he felt was uh, the least significant, uh, not very important, so he used it the least of these eight manuscripts that he had. The ones that he thought were really primo manuscripts were of recent vintage, about 200 years older than the time that Erasmus was doing his work. So they were 14th century manuscripts. 
13th century manuscripts. And he thought that they went back to the time of the apostles. Obviously, paleography, the dating of manuscripts by handwriting analysis, was not a science that had been invented yet. But uh, that's what Erasmus used. And what was really remarkable is uh, all these manuscripts he found at Basel. Now, earlier this year, uh, a couple of us from CSNTM were invited to go to the University of Basel this year to meet with some scholars to talk about the Erasmus collections and other things. And it would, would have been a, just a terrific trip to be in Basel. I've never been to Basel. I've been to uh, many, many places in Europe, but not Basel. And that's both where Erasmus got his text published and where Karl Barth uh, did his, uh, uh, his teaching. And uh, I wanted to go there to, to see these manuscripts and then my knee went bad this summer, so I couldn't take that trip. It was going to be a combined trip to Athens and Basel and Edinburgh for various projects, but my knee was no good at the time. So Erasmus used three manuscripts extensively, and he used them like they were printer's copy. Printer's copy is where you take a document that you give to the printer, and you're marking it up to say, here's some minor tweaks and some corrections that I need to make. He's doing this on biblical manuscripts. Each one of these was a unique handwritten manuscript. Well, that's what all books were at the time. He didn't, he, I mean, to him it was just a book because it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't like a printed text. There was no printed text of the Greek New Testament yet. And I've, I've wanted to see these, and we want to come and photograph these manuscripts that he used as printer's copy. I have seen some manuscripts that even later scholars have marked up. Uh, Tischendorf, the man who, uh, Constantine von Tischendorf, the man who discovered Codex Sinaiticus at St. Catherine's Monastery at uh, the base of Mount Sinai in Egypt. Uh, he discovered it. He went there three times, and in 1859, he found uh, the New Testament, uh, which made its way finally to the British Museum through Russia. It's a really uh, convoluted but fascinating story. But uh, Tischendorf also uh, was the man to work through what's called a palimpsest. That's a manuscript that's been scraped over and rewritten on by a later scribe, sometimes many centuries later, and sometimes these scribes scrape that parchment text off so cleanly that you can't even see, you can see that there was something there, but that was it. Tischendorf spent two years of his life in his 20s at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, looking at this one manuscript that was 157 leaves, reading the undertext that had been scraped off and written over on top of. 157 leaves, it took him two years to write out every single letter that he could make out. He was the first one to be able to read uh, much of the text, and he was able to read 99% of it. Well, I had the privilege of being at the Bibliothèque, the National Library of Paris, a few years ago, and I asked to look at four manuscripts when I was there. And I was told, sorry, these are all on the Grand Reserve. Nobody gets to look at them. And then they saw that I was with CSNTM, and they said, oh, well, we know about CSNTM. You may look at them. So it's kind of nice to, to flash those kinds of credentials every once in a while. Right, Stratton? You know about that. <laughs> so uh, use it to, to, you know, if you, if you, if you want to use CSNTM. No, I'm not going to let you do that. Anyway, um, we will disavow all knowledge of your existence. So I had a chance to look at this manuscript. It's co called Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus from the 400s. And it was originally a complete Bible. These leaves that had been scraped over again, it has some sermons by Ephraim the Syrian uh, written on them uh, diagonally. And the leaves are inserted sometimes upside down, sideways, it doesn't matter. The scribe who, who cannibalized this older manuscript just carved them up and stuck them into this new codex. And Tischendorf wrote at the very front of this codex his own notes about what's on each leaf. So he gave a table of contents in his own handwriting on this uh, fifth century manuscript. And I thought, boy, you'd get thrown in jail if you did that kind of thing today. That's what Erasmus did, that's what Tischendorf did. I've seen Scrivener, a very brilliant uh, 19th century British scholar, and uh, Gregory, Caspar René Gregory, an American who was Tischendorf's last student and he ended up teaching at Leipzig University in, in German for many, many years. I saw his, his notes in some of the manuscripts at the National Library of Greece uh, the last couple of years. Gregory, by the way, uh, decided after he lived in Germany for many decades that when World War I broke out, he would 
join the army. And so he joined the German army in 1914 at age 68 as an infantryman. So I guess Donald Trump could be president. You know, his health is good now. Uh, found out today weighs 267 pounds, so maybe not. But uh, uh, predictably, uh, Gregory did not survive the war. Um, 68 years old, and he goes, oh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll be a ground troop fellow. He was brilliant on some areas, but not when it came to that. All right, so this was Erasmus. Question I had was, did these manuscripts come from Constantinople? Were they part of the manuscripts, groups of manuscripts that the monks and scribes brought with them when they left Constantinople in 1453? So I did some research on this and discovered that no, these had already been in Basel uh, for about 21 years before that. 1432, there was a conference in Basel, Switzerland, and there was a scholar from Eastern Europe who brought these Greek manuscripts with him and they'd been sitting there, nobody could read them because they couldn't read Greek. So when Erasmus came along and he knew his Greek well, he said, have you got some Greek manuscripts? Oh yeah, we got these three. Okay, let me use those as uh, printer's copy and let's, let's get rolling to the printing press. Well, this is a curiosity about this in the history of publishing. This is the kind of thing you can raise with your friends who think they know something about uh, Bible translation and Bible publishing. Erasmus's text was not the first printed New Testament, not the first printed Greek New Testament. The first printed New Testament, of course, was the Latin Vulgate that uh, Gutenberg did, did, but Erasmus's was not the first printed Greek New Testament. But you heard me say earlier, it was the first published Greek New Testament. Both of those things are true. It was the first published Greek New Testament done on a printing press, but not the first printed Greek New Testament. All right, so how do we solve that issue? Well, Erasmus and Froben had learned about some Spaniards who were working on a whole Bible in multiple languages, including Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and Latin and some other languages, Syriac, some other things. It's called a polyglot when you have multiple languages. And they've been working on this since 1501. They completed this six-volume work, or at least they completed the New Testament part of it, in 1514, but they wanted to wait until the Old Testament also was finished before they published it. And so Erasmus, is, is, he, he only gets wind of this. Uh, he doesn't really know the details, didn't even know that it had been printed yet. They made 800 or 600 copies. They stored them in uh, a warehouse in Spain once the Old Testament text got done. So they made these 600 copies. And that all got done in 1520. But they waited, that's when they got the Pope's imprimatur to actually get this published. That's what they were waiting for. But then they waited two more years before it got published. Inexplicably, we don't know why, they waited until 1522. By that time, Erasmus had a six-year head start. His book came out in 1516. It had been sweeping through Europe. People were buying it, scholars were buying it up like it was a bestseller. I mean, it would, it would have been a New York bestseller if New York had existed at the time. Uh, and so uh, Erasmus got a head start on the Complutensian polyglot, and consequently, his first two editions, just his first two editions, uh, 1516, 1519, 3,300 copies were printed. The first and only edition of the Complutensian polyglot, 600 copies. So. By the time the Complutensian polyglot came out, Erasmus's New Testament was already uh, hitting its stride in the market. People knew about that one. It was in many respects really quite inferior to the Complutensian polyglot. They had uh, some scholars who had really worked on this, although they don't tell what manuscripts they used. We're not sure exactly to this day what manuscripts they used, but it seems to be a better Greek text. But because Erasmus was out there first, his is the one that has stood the test of time. Within Erasmus's lifetime, by the time of 1536, by the time he died, over 300,000 copies of his Greek New Testament had been printed. That's huge. And 600 of the Complutensian Polyglot, 300,000 of Erasmus. Well, this is the one that took over basically, it became the basis for the translation of the New Testament into every single modern language except Roman Catholic translations that still translated from the Latin Vulgate because that, of course, was the inspired text. And so until Vatican II, the Catholics could not 
translate from the Greek and publish it that way. Here, here are some pages from the Complutensian Polyglot and uh, from the Old Testament. It's uh, really, it's, it's complex, and you'll see pay, well, more pictures of, of Erasmus's text. So there were some reactions to his publication. Many Roman Catholics rejected it. Now keep in mind, this came out in 1516 before there was Protestantism. By the time of 1519, uh, the, the second edition, the Protestants had been around for a couple of years, so just, just getting off the ground. And they endorsed it, saying this is going back to the sources. So ad fontes between, became their battle cry, back to the sources, back to the Greek and Hebrew. And here's, here's an interesting irony. The Catholic faith viewed going back not to the original, going back to Jerome's Latin Vulgate, and going forward still to Jerome's Latin Vulgate. That was the text that would be read in the churches. And so they've got this 1,100-year period of text in the, in the manuscripts, and this is what they're reading in the churches. Protestants wanted to reach back further, back to the original languages, but they were not content to leave it there. Protestants could have said, we are going to read from the Greek and Hebrew every Sunday and not translate it, like the Catholic priests did. They didn't do that. They said, we want to get back to the original sources and translate it for the people. And so Protestantism is much broader in, in terms of its historical coverage than uh, Roman Catholicism in that respect. In the 1519 edition, Erasmus's Latin translation was new and improved really significantly over Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And this was the, the Greek Latin translation that Luther used when he published his German New Testament. The 1522 was what uh, Tyndale used for his, and so there's a little bit of a history, a difference of history, the, the German New Testament versus the English. Well, this threatened the religious establishment because Erasmus was saying, I'm correcting the inspired text, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, from Greek manuscripts. You can't do that. And so by the time of the Council of Trent, a year or nine years after Erasmus died, uh, they had banned uh, his New Testament and several other of his books. He had actually taught at Cambridge University, I mentioned this last time, as the Lady Margaret Chair of Divinity at Cambridge University, and then they banned his books a few years later because of the Council of Trent. So this was a huge threat to the, uh, the hierarchy at the time. Well, there were imperfections in the text, and yet early reformers didn't have much by way of a critique of this text. We'll talk a little bit about some of the imperfections this time and the next time I'll talk about the most famous uh, imperfection that came about in his third edition that has affected the King James Bible and other translations and we'll wrestle with the implications about how we derive our theology from the Bible. How is it legitimate to do so? And it deals with whether the Trinity is a true doctrine. I hope that woke you up. Okay, so this was a, a rush job in printed. He said, I have got through six years of work in eight, eight months. He was working like a, a dog. And while they were actually putting these pages in the printing press, they were making corrections as they went. So all sorts of changes. Hundreds and hundreds of typographical errors were created. And I mentioned Scrivener earlier. He was this 19th century uh, British uh, New Testament scholar. And he said, Erasmus's first edition is, in that respect, the most faulty book I know. In other words, in the respect of how many typographical errors, spelling errors, hundreds, probably thousands of mistakes in it. When Erasmus had a copy, had one copy of the book of Revelation, and I'll, I'll get to that. That's how we'll conclude, and we'll take some time for Q&A. But uh, when he had that, that manuscript, it was a, a manuscript that had commentary. The, all of our manuscripts of Revelation are either strictly the book of Revelation, or they have commentary by a man named Andreas. And this was one that had the commentary by Andreas. Now, when you have scripture and commentary in these old manuscripts, almost always there is a very clear distinction between scripture and commentary. The scripture is either going to be uh, written out in uh, a more expensive ink. It might be gold ink or red ink as opposed to just the regular brown ink that, that becomes brown because of the iron base. It may be written in capital letters, and then the commentary would be written in lowercase. It may be front and center in the, in, the, in the page and in larger font, and then the commentary has wraparound commentary on it. One of, those are the, one of those three are the basic ways in which it was done. Well, this particular manuscript, the only manuscript of Revelation Erasmus had access to, did none of that. And so the typesetters 
who were not as familiar with the Greek New Testament as we might be, well, the New Testament as we might be today, weren't sure whether they were talking about is this scripture or is this commentary? So they got some places mixed up where they threw some commentary into the scripture that made its way into the King James Bible. So that's uh, his first edition. Let me just talk to you about this one imperfection. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of imperfections. So these typos, then the Latin interpolations. Here's a nice one in Acts 9, verses 4 through 6. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. This is the New King James Version. Now, I was uh, Art Farstad's assistant. He was the one who was the editor of the New King James Bible. Not the King James. I'm not quite that old. But uh, the New King James... And I would go over to his house back in the 1970s while I was a master's student at Dallas Seminary and, and work on uh, a lot of proofreading for him. Uh, I made hundreds of suggestions on how they should translate better, I think none of which were uh, accepted. But, you know, a, a young student who doesn't know anything makes those kinds of foolish statements. But one thing that was accepted was they said their, their objective was to translate Erasmus's Greek New Testament. They did not want to translate what's called the majority text, which is what Art Farstad and Zane Hodges, another professor at Dallas Seminary at the time, had published based on the majority of Greek manuscripts. Almost all of these are later manuscripts, like what Erasmus used. But uh, this was Erasmus's text that they wanted to publish, and one of, the, one of the translators who translated James was publishing it on a critically reconstructed text based on older manuscripts. And so I at least was able to, to catch that. But even though none of the translators, none of the scholars who worked on the New King James Bible believed that in, in these instances they were translating what was the original scriptures, they still wanted to honor the King James tradition. And I felt, I, I, I didn't agree with that, but here's what you have here. What's uh, in blue is, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, the rest of it. This is lifted right out of Acts chapter 26, verse 14, where uh, Paul is again recounting his conversion experience, but it was not found in this passage except by way of one Latin manuscript that got inserted here. So Erasmus actually puts the Greek in to match the Latin at this point. So it's, it's not in the Greek at all. There's no other Greek manuscripts that have this. All right, so then there's imperfections in the Greek text, and this is where I'll conclude. This is uh, the second most imperfection in the Greek text, uh, we might say. Uh, in some ways, this is the most notorious one. And the other one did not occur in the first edition. It was an imperfection that was added in the third edition under pressure from the Roman Catholic Church. So Erasmus has this codex. Now, a codex is just like our, our modern books, like this worship hymnal, where it's bound on one side and you have cut pages. And like anybody who's ever had a paperback novel and you're reading that, uh, well, growing up in Southern California, you'd bring, bring these things to the beach, and by the time you're done with a couple days there, the covers would fall off. And, then, and if you had a, a murder mystery, the last couple pages would usually fall out, so you never know who done it. And... Uh, that's what happens with a codex. With a scroll, the last leaf of the manuscript is the most secure. With a codex, the last leaf is the most insecure because with a scroll, you're rolling the thing up, and so that last part is what is uh, hidden inside. But with a codex, it's the front and the end, the beginning and the end, that are going to be insecure. So Erasmus had this one manuscript that had more than revelation, but he used this manuscript really only for revelation. And it was missing the last leaf of Revelation. So verses 16 through 22 are not in this. And so Erasmus is trying to get his manuscript published, his Greek New Testament published. And even though he claims everything is in the Greek, I didn't use uh, Latin, I mean, I didn't interpolate the Latin into Greek, that's exactly what he did here. He back-translated from Latin these seven verses into Greek, Greek, 
and he created 17 textual variants that have not been found in any other Greek manuscripts, except those that were based on his published text. 17 textual variants. And so my students laugh at that and say, oh, the guy's an idiot. I said, okay, take out your Bibles, take out your Latin Bibles, and back translate any page into Greek, and let's see how well you do. And they go, okay, never mind. So uh, uh, he was brilliant. He came up with some interesting things, but I want to show you this one uh, textual variant that is really uh, fascinating that you may not know is due to no Greek evidence whatsoever. And it has to do with Revelation 22:19. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Well, we have in the Greek, not book of life, but tree of life. That seems to have a bit of a different emphasis, don't you think? God shall take away his part out of the book of life versus the tree of life. One has to do with whether that person is apparently even saved. That would be the book of life. Their name is written in the book of life. And it sounds as if, if you say, that God will take away his part out of the book of life, that someone could lose their salvation. That's how this sounds. But there's no Greek manuscripts that say book of life, not one, except for a couple of manuscripts that came after Erasmus's published text. And yet book of life is what was published in the King James Bible, not tree of life. So how did this come about? Well, it's an inner Latin corruption. You have libro for book and ligno for tree. And so consequently, it's just two letters difference, but in Greek, the, the words are completely different. And consequently, this is something that happened within the Latin copying tradition that they were writing out ligno, uh, and somebody then wrote libro at, at one point uh, because of the book of life that is already, or the book that's written uh, right after this. So you see book earlier in the verse, you see book at the end of the verse, and so somebody says, it must be talking about book, or they just weren't paying attention, and they write book instead of tree, right in the very place where now it affects whether we are eternally secure or not. King James Bible has that, but modern translations don't. So that was the biggest mistake uh, that he made, that uh, he finally owned up to it and said, okay, uh, well, I didn't, not everything was in the Greek. I did have to back translate from Latin. He was apparently trying to hurry to get his New Testament published before the Complutensian Polyglot came out. And this is what the King James is based on. Now, the King James is a great translation. It was a terrific translation in its day. But it's not perfect, just like no translation is perfect. And it's 400 years old. And consequently, there's going to be some problems with it. But we need to be aware of this and say, uh, this is still what God has used to bless his people, to cause us to grow in faith. And this is the one place where a, uh, at least in the King James Bible, a non-essential doctrine, a very important doctrine, but not essential for salvation. If you don't believe in eternal security, you can still be saved. After all, that's why we have John Wesley and the Methodists, right? I think some of those folks actually know the Lord. So uh, uh, here's a, a passage that has been misrendered in uh, uh, Erasmus's Greek text and therefore translated as Book of Life in the King James, but modern translations have Tree of Life. But this was not the biggest issue. There was trouble brewing over one passage, and that's one that we'll talk about next week that deals with the Trinity. So let me give you some concluding thoughts here, and then we'll take some time for questions. All together, there's actually about 5,000 differences in Erasmus's Greek New Testament. And the critical Greek text that's used today that stands behind virtually all modern translations, and when I say virtually all, I mean all, except for the New King James Bible, which is based on Erasmus's text. About 5,000 differences in the Greek. Well, that sounds like good grief. We can't possibly get back to the original wording. Except for the fact that uh, the vast majority of these can't even be translated. There's no difference in meaning, there's just difference in spelling. That's for the majority of them. And not a single cardinal doctrine is jeopardized by any viable variant. By a viable variant, I mean 
a, a variant that actually has some plausibility of going back to the original. Even Revelation 22:19, it's not a it's not a viable variant, but it's also not a cardinal doctrine. Uh, so I, I've worded this carefully to say there's no cardinal doctrine that's jeopardized by this. So when you see what the Westminster Confession says that is based really on the King James Bible, uh, that uh, confession is still uh, adopted today by Presbyterians, even though they use, or I should say we use, because I'm, I'm now a Presbyterian, um, modern translations. And so there's no cardinal doctrine that's jeopardized by any viable variant. And then I want to talk about briefly the growth of the text. Over the 1400 years of copying until Erasmus's Greek New Testament was published, the Greek New Testament grew. It's kind of like a snowball rolling down a hill. When you roll a snowball down, I know you're all from Texas, so you have no idea what a snowball is. It just humor me. This is, you may have seen it on some movies or something like that. But um, a snowball is, you know, as it rolls down the hill, it collects foreign elements. And you'll get some leaves and twigs. And so it, it grows. By the time it gets down to the bottom of the hill, you've got a bigger snowball. And that's what happened with the Greek New Testament. How much bigger? In 1,400 years, it grew by 2%. If you were an economist and you told an investor, I want you to invest in this, it's going to grow 2%, but it'll take 1,400 years. Is that something you're going to buy into? It's remarkable how God has preserved the scriptures without them getting very much contaminated in the process. No cardinal doctrine is jeopardized. And the growth of it is not like 50% like we have in a lot of other ancient literature, especially religious literature of other, other uh, religions, but not with the scripture. So, next week, our final week, will be Erasmus's Greek New Testament, part two, and we'll look at a perceived imperfection in Erasmus's text and its effect on the Bible in English. So that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. That kind of sets us up for our last thing. Thank you for your attention. I think we have time for some questions. It's really hard to tell if he was a believer. Uh, he and Melanchthon got along. Melanchthon wanted him to be a part of the Reformation, but uh, Erasmus was, he, he was a man who did not like controversy, uh, unlike Luther who was stimulated by controversy, I think. But Erasmus just wanted to do his study and not uh, be in the middle of a phrase, and yet he was in the middle of all the, the big ones at the time. And uh, the Pope said, Erasmus, we need your scholarship. He was, he was the literary giant of the 16th century Europe, and yet his name is almost unknown today. Luther has outshined him, and, and for good reason. But uh, Erasmus, his, his authority, if he could throw his weight onto some view, that would help. And so the, the, the Catholic hierarchy said, uh, Erasmus, we need you to write against Luther. And he had corresponded with Luther. He liked what Luther was saying. At a certain point, he felt Luther was going too far. And he wrote to him and said, I think you've pushed, pushed the envelope a little bit too far. But then he was forced to write a book called The Freedom of the Will to which Luther responded with the bondage of the will. And to read these two books, this is, it's kind of like this season of political debate. I mean, it, it, these people were all ad hominem, Luther and Erasmus, and uh, <laughs> dealing with each other in some pretty nasty ways. So it's, it's quite entertaining reading, actually. But um, Erasmus didn't want to go there. He wasn't nearly as reformed as Luther wanted him to be. And because he wrote that book, uh, Luther said, I can't have him be part of our movement even though Melanchthon said, yeah, we really need to get him involved in this. So he ended up dying as a Roman Catholic priest, but on the outside, because here, just nine years after he died, his books were banned by the Catholic Church. And his Greek New Testament became the basis for all Protestant translations for the next 300 years. You had one last week, didn't you, Vicki? I, did. I think you're only allowed one every other week, aren't you? Okay. <laughs>
Oh, they, they were not from the monks and scribes leaving Constantinople in 1453, but they almost surely came from Constantinople maybe 100 years earlier. They did not get to Basel until 1432, though, with a man who came from Eastern Europe, and he, there was a major council they had in Basel. And so he brought them and left them there for the university. Uh, it, well, I, I may have said something like that in terms, there, there's different ways you, you may want to define that, but in terms of the quality of the handwriting or in terms of the quality of the text, they were, they were well trained in terms of writing out that text. Maybe we talked about this at dinner uh, last Wednesday with you and Glenn. Oh, maybe so. Yeah, they, 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 were, they were professionally trained scribes, but the text that they were uh, copying was not that good. It had been corrupted over the centuries. When I say not that good, I'm saying this is rather relative. It's a rather small number of, of differences, really, that can even be translated. So. The, the point I was getting at is just the, again, you touched on this last week, but just the amazing act of God spreading those manuscripts, that they were all right there, and then God said, I exactly. to spread, and so they did and, and with it, Greek knowledge, and all of a sudden there's, there are other Greek manuscripts in monasteries throughout Europe, although in the Western Europe not so much. And all of a sudden these scholars found out about them, and they learned Greek, and that, was, that became a very exciting thing, obviously. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, his other writings? Oh, he was, he was uh, yes, he had biting sarcasm in almost everything he wrote. And even to his good friends, he would just come down hard on them. This is just how Erasmus was. That's how they all, not all of them, but a lot of people were back then. And so he, he, we still have thousands of his letters published. And uh, there, there's, a, there's two different groups of publications, but the one in Holland is doing... Uh, Probably they're more industrious. They have them both in Latin. All of his letters were in Latin and then an English translation. And it's up to 89 volumes now for his letters. Uh, they're not done yet. They've got a long ways to go. And they'll have hundreds in each volume. It's just, just incredible. I, I have no idea how many letters he published. But... Yes, sir. Any, any more debates with Lord Irvin? No, I've had three with him, and we've both decided that that's probably enough on that issue. Uh, he's, I understand he's, somebody just told me he's giving lectures on something recently. Was that here? Somebody here at the church told me that? No, maybe earlier today, I guess, at the school, somebody One mentioned it. One of the it. sad things is I, I, I utilize the great courses a lot. Yeah. Traveling back and forth. But uh, it, it would appear that they they present him as a Christian, uh, <laughs> frequently, and, and the headings of his courses would lead you to think that he may be, and it, it's, to me it's kind of tragic. It's very tragic and very deceptive. Uh, I have often said that, that Ehrman uh, makes chicken littles of his followers, which is not the mark of a good teacher. He gets people to be so scared that the sky is falling and, and without really giving them uh, the, the true story and the full story of what's going on. Uh, so that's, that's a real problem with him. And he's, not, he's by no means a Christian. Uh, he not only denies the deity of Christ and his substitutionary atonement and his resurrection, he was for many, many years an agnostic, but now he's an atheist. And when he was an agnostic, he wrote a book called God's Problem where he said, well, if there is a God, it's certainly not the God of the Bible. That's an, a, a Nazi-like deity. Uh, so I would say that's probably not something a Christian could say. <laughs> well, I've, I've talked to him and tried to get him to explain what he is, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. You've talked to him in, in person? Well, I've talked to the great court. Oh, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. and how, how can you present this guy? Well, they're, they're biblical studies courses. Well, the people the, that teach those are not all Christians. It's amazing 
have Judas as a good example of that. I've heard of that maybe secondhand, but I'm not. I, I can't speak to that issue. Yes, sir. Yeah, of course, James is a friend of mine. So is Bart. Mm -hmm. So you want to know who Bart Ehrman is? Yeah, he he. Uh, at least made a confession of faith in high school, had a so-called conversion experience. And uh, then he went to Moody Bible Institute, uh, wanted to learn Greek, and so he finished out at Wheaton College, both solid evangelical schools, learned Greek at Wheaton College, and got interested in manuscript studies in the text of the New Testament. So he went to Princeton Seminary, a Presbyterian school, which although largely liberal, it's it's, uh, probably its best New Testament scholar ever was Bruce Metzger. And he was a fairly conservative um, a scholar, a brilliant man, very gracious, certainly loved the Lord. Uh, and uh, he was Ehrman's professor at Princeton Seminary, and, and he was probably the best textual scholar of the 20th century, Bar uh, Bruce Metzger was. So Ehrman studied under Metzger, and then he studied under Metzger for his PhD as well. And got his PhD in textual criticism. And uh, then Bart started to, in his PhD program, which is the first time I met him back in 82, so we've known each other for three decades, uh, he started to drift uh, out of evangelicalism and then later out of orthodoxy in any sense and then out of even the Christian faith where he became agnostic. And just, just this summer he claimed to be an atheist, so that's an, a recent development. He, in the last, I'd say in the last uh, eight or nine years, he continues to move further and further to the left, which is very sad to see. Uh, but um, he is the most influential religious, religious scholar in America, uh, far more influential than anybody else. And when he wrote Misquoting Jesus about the text of the New Testament, it became a New York Times bestseller, his first one, I believe. And every popular book he has done since that time has also been a bestseller uh, because of that first one, which was the area of his discipline, but the other areas, that, that's not really where he works nearly as much. So he's had a huge influence, and he, he has influenced, I'd say, uh, very conservatively, tens of thousands of college kids who, raised in a Christian home, have abandoned the Christian faith because of his writings. And so... I, I get emails every week uh, from people who say, uh, thank you for what you've written, thank you for your debates with Bart Ehrman because it, it salvaged my faith. Well, I'm, I'm always nervous when that's what salvages their faith, but at the same time, there are people who are returning to the faith because they are wrestling with all the data, not just what, what Bart Ehrman has to say. So that is, in a nutshell, who he is. Uh, yeah, that's what he says. This is his second wife. Uh, his first one was a believer. Bart led his parents and his brother to the Lord, and they still profess Christ, uh, even though he doesn't. It's really ironic. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he, he says his wife is a believer. She's uh, Episcopalian, I think, and goes to church on a regular basis. So I met her. I, I, you know, I don't know anything else, but uh, whether she really is. Yes, it's very good. And um, what Dr. Radford was referring to, there's a, a company called the Teaching Company who has that has DVDs on all kinds of subjects. And unfortunately, most of their ones on religion are by our earth. And so mm. that's what... Is that the Great Courses? Great Courses. Yeah. The teaching company. Yeah. Yeah. They, they even advertise on television. Right. Too. Yeah. And, and Bart Ehrman has been on popular TV shows and things, so it's really a matter for our prayer. Uh, there's a lot of 
Thank you all very much for coming tonight, and I hope to see you all next week, too.